to be in this thing that we spend so much time together that we know what the other likes to eat, that we know what the other is thinking, that we can spend long stretches of time together without talking. What do you call that? I'm honestly scared the crap out of me, but I'm going to give it a try. If that's what you want. Good morning. Uh, Sarah's not here. She's not working here anymore, so don't waste your time looking for her. I'm not here looking for her. I want to have a chat with you. Relax. You don't have to be so nervous. I don't bite. Who says I'm nervous? Go away. Natasha, why are you treating me like a stranger? Did Zara say anything bad about me? Nothing. I'm in a bad mood. Cannot. Uh. Remember in the early days when I just started to come around here? You'll be telling Zara, hey, your Luntung boy is here. This program is available on demand for free on Me Watch. Brought to you by Mitsubishi Electric Starmex Air Conditioner. Tonight on 5. Good evening, I'm Otelie Edwards. Here and here are your top stories on News 5. A law has been passed to allow Singaporeans who are on stay home and quarantine orders to vote outside their electoral divisions. Singapore to boost testing capacity by five times later this year. The end goal is 40,000 per day. Meantime, MPs question the government's handling of infections within a migrant worker community. Manufacturing in April hits its lowest level since the global financial crisis in 2008. Singaporean serving stay-at-home notices will be able to vote even if they are staying at facilities outside their electoral divisions. A bill has been passed giving authorities the power to make special arrangements to conduct a safe election during the COVID-19 pandemic. Voters serving stay-at-home notices at government-designated facilities can either vote from the hotel they are staying at or at special polling stations arranged by the government. These special stations have been likened to overseas polling stations. The stations may operate shorter hours, though, instead of the usual voting hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Meanwhile, aspiring election candidates can appoint someone to act on their behalf on nomination day. That's if they're serving a stay-at-home notice, quarantine order, or are in poor health. The representatives will be allowed to file nomination papers and raise objections to nomination papers of other candidates. Both these provisions are only part of the temporary arrangements to make sure a general election can be run safely. The Elections Department also said it will share guidelines for campaigning in due course. While this bill enables the Elections Department and the returning officer to make contingency plans for the next general election, which must be held within a year from now, the bill is unrelated to the timing of the general election. The Prime Minister will decide when to call the election, considering the challenges confronting our country and the evolving COVID-19 situation. The next general election must be held by 14th April next year. Well, Singapore is set to boost 
testing capacity to 40,000 a day later this year. A nationwide testing strategy is also in the works to allow for better detection of unlinked cases. Ramping up coronavirus testing is part of Singapore's three-pronged approach towards lifting circuit breaker restrictions. The strategy outlined by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong last month also includes the gradual easing of safe distancing measures and using technology to trace COVID-19 infections. Singapore has conducted 140,000 tests for COVID-19 so far, which translates to about 2,500 tests per 100,000 people. It's already among the highest testing rates in the world, but authorities hope to expand this even more. Currently, we have the capacity to conduct, to conduct more than 8,000 PCR tests a day in total across our community and migrant workers in the dormitories, up from 2,900 a day in early April. We are working with various private and public sector partners to progressively increase our testing capacity further to up to 40,000 a day. Mr Gunn explained that the main test used now is the polymerase chain reaction or PCR test. It's the gold standard for detecting infection by picking up the virus from a nose or throat swab. Serological tests, which indicate a past infection, are also being done by the National Centre for Infectious Diseases to study the level of infections among specific groups such as healthcare workers and their close contacts. A nationwide testing study is being developed in line with the higher testing capacity. It will involve more extensive community surveillance so that we are better able to detect any unlinked cases in the community. We will also prioritize the testing of higher risk and more vulnerable groups. Such selective testing is also being carried out on patients without symptoms. We currently test asymptomatic young children if they are in the same household as COVID-19 patients since they may not be able to articulate their symptoms well. And in that addition, a key priority is to protect vulnerable groups. This includes seniors, particularly nursing home residents. Mr Gunn added that doing this for the entire population would not be effective as there is no widespread community transmission and therefore would not be the best use of testing resources. When asked by MP Leon Pereira if Singapore is testing sewage as a way to determine clusters, Mr Gunn said trials are in fact being done. There are challenges because sewage by nature would have been significantly diluted. So we will need to test the sensitivity and see whether we are able to pick up uh, sufficient uh, 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 fragments to be able to determine uh, whether there is significant uh, infection in particular target area. So it's something that we are studying, uh, but it has uh, its inherent challenges and you may not be able to uh, deploy it for all kinds of uh, settings. Countries like Switzerland and Australia have conducted such sewage and wastewater testing for the infection. Well, Singapore is coming up with new contact tracing solutions for those who don't have smartphones like seniors. It's also working to improve its two existing tech solutions, which aims to speed up tracking of COVID-19 infections. The first is Safe Entry, which is a digital check-in, check-out system to log the visits by individuals in all business premises and venues. The second is the Trace Together app, which uses Bluetooth on your phones to quickly identify whom you have been near to so that we can track your close contacts when the need arises. The team is now working with Apple and Google so to enhance this app and to make it more effective, especially on iOS phones. Uh, we are also developing solutions for the elderly and young who may not have smartphones. Uh, and when, it's, when the work is ready, we will announce more details. Health Minister Gan Kim Yong says Singapore has sufficient capacity to take care of COVID-19 patients as well as the flexibility to repurpose existing wards where needed. He assures that the country's healthcare system has the ability to support more than 900 ICU beds if the situation calls for it. We have about 150 vacant ICU beds and can quickly bring another 300 online. But we are not taking any chances as we must preserve our buffer capacity. Mr Leon Pereira had asked about our ability to further ramp up. The public hospitals have put in place plans to ensure that their infrastructure, equipment, 
medications and manpower are in place to add another 450 ICU beds by mid-May if needed. Meanwhile, 11,000 people have signed up to volunteer with the SG Healthcare Corps after the scheme was expanded to include non-healthcare professionals. The spike is almost four times the number of volunteers from about a week ago. Those without prior medical experience will receive training to take on supporting roles like performing swabs or basic care. I'm heartened by this overwhelming response from Singaporeans. So far, we have matched about 800 core members to various needs on the ground and they are being progressively deployed and we will do more. Members of the SG Healthcare Corps can be, will be remunerated for their time and contribution when they are deployed to work alongside our healthcare workers on the ground. More than $7 billion have been paid to employers through the job support scheme last month. Another $4 billion will be handed out this month. Separately, nearly $1 billion is expected to be paid out to support the self-employed. The first such payments will start at the end of this month. More than that, NTUC is helping through the SCP training support scheme, which now provides an hourly training allowance of $10. This comes to about $400 for a week-long course, while modest compared to the income SCPs may have earned in the past, it will still help defray their daily expenditure as they learn new skills during this downtime. I am very encouraged that already about 1,800 SCPs will benefit from the scheme. Another $675 million in foreign worker levy waivers and rebates will be paid out by July. Some 62,000 employers would receive a total of over $675 million in rebates this month. Another $2.2 billion of workfare support aimed at helping lower wage workers will be paid out this, this year. A 61-year-old man has been arrested for attempted murder after he allegedly stabbed a National Parks Board officer. The victim sustained serious injuries but was conscious when he was sent to the hospital. Police said N Parks officers saw the man cutting plants illegally in the Sungai Serangoon Park connector. He was not wearing a mask. The man then turned aggressive when they approached him and attacked one of the officers with a sharp instrument, causing serious injuries to the victim's chest, arm and hand. The man then fled the scene on his bicycle before the police arrived, but was arrested shortly after. Investigations are ongoing. And still ahead on News 5, more than a thousand employers caught for housing workers in poor condition. And Malaysia given the green light to loosen lockdown restrictions, but at least half a million people aren't too keen. My Mitsubishi electric Starmax aircon saves me energy and money. It's easy to clean and is so quiet. To be your brilliant self, go black. System Sonic Brilliant Black Toothbrush helps provide up to seven times better cleaning ability. It has sonic wave vibration, super tapered soft and slim bristles, and a thinner brush head. Go brilliant, go black. System. Welcome back to News 5. Singapore has reported 573 new COVID-19 cases today, taking the national tally to 18,778. 
Well, the health ministry says majority of the new cases continue to be migrant workers staying in dormitories. Five are Singaporeans or permanent residents. Manpower Minister Josephine Teo says there was no indication of a higher prevalence of COVID-19 infections among migrant workers, even after the first cluster in that community was detected in February. She says most infected workers showed mild symptoms and many were only detected through active case finding. This may explain why up to the middle of March, the cases of workers at the dormitories testing positive were few and far between. Once evidence emerged that the virus had spread in the dormitories, we decided to deal with it squarely and quickly and mobilise the whole of government resources. And also taking the spotlight in Parliament, living conditions in foreign worker dormitories. Mrs. Teo says an average of 1,200 employers were taken to task for unacceptable accommodation each year. 20 operators have also breached rules for large dormitories. MOM alone has about 100 dormitory inspectors, full-time, who work under the supervision of the Commissioner for Foreign Employee Dormitories two deputy commissioners and eight assistant commissioners. Last year, these officers conducted 1,200 inspections and 3,000 investigations across all housing types. There will be many more when other agencies are included. Where lapses are found, dormitory operators must rectify them immediately. Now, following the ministerial statements, several MPs ask questions largely focused on how the government is handling infections within the migrant worker community. COVID-19 infections among migrant workers make up the largest group in Singapore by far. It prompted nominated Member of Parliament, Anthea Ong, to ask if the authorities will investigate the reasons behind the high infection rates among this group. We are committed to doing a comprehensive review after the crisis. It's more than just a review on dormitories, it's a review on the whole pandemic. Uh, from start to finish and our response, the actual nature of it, the form of it, the timing of it, clearly it's not possible to say today when we're still fighting a battle for which we do not know when it will end. Mr Lawrence Wong, who's also the co-chair of the multi-ministry task force dealing with the outbreak, says the government will announce the review when it is ready. Ms Ong also posed another question, this time to the manpower minister. So will the government consider issuing an apology to the migrant workers, given the dismelled conditions that they are currently in? The minister replied that close interactions with workers happen at a regular basis in and outside the dormitories, and their requests and feedback are followed up. What they are focused on is how we can help them to handle this present situation, not fall sick, and if they fall sick, how to take care of them, how to look after you know, their wages being paid, how to ensure that they can send money home. These are the things that they have asked of us. I have not come across one single migrant worker himself that has demanded an apology. Other MPs like Mr Peng Yang Huat also asked about conditions in dormitories and who was ultimately responsible for the living standards there. Under the Foreign Employee Dormitory Act, um, the licensed operator and dorm owners should be the party to be held accountable to raise the standard of living in the dormitories in the interest of public health and safety. So why the MOM involve the employer in the application of the provision of this act in this instance? Mrs. Teo said employers pay dorm operators to accommodate their workers, and any change, such as having fewer individuals in a room, may cost more. Whatever the business the employer is in, this goes into his cost considerations and ultimately he will pass it on to whoever buys his uh, products and services. So that's something that you know, we must always keep in mind. Um, it's not so difficult for MOM by the stroke of a pen to change some numbers here and there, but we have to consider the overall implications and whether it is bearable 
for the employers. MP Sylvia Lim asked whether the government has tried to trace the origin of the virus within dorms. We don't exactly know how the transmission in the dormitories got started. Uh, we also don't want to speculate about its um, exact origins um, because it's not helpful to risk any group uh, within the dormitories being targeted. The minister added that the aim is bringing the situation under control and preventing a reoccurrence. Home-based food businesses have been allowed to resume operations from next week because the COVID-19 situation in Singapore has improved. Minister in charge of Muslim Affairs, Masago Zulkifli, says the Singapore Malay Chamber of Commerce and Industry has reached out to about 1,800 such businesses to help them access government support schemes. He was responding to an adjournment motion raised by MP Intan Azura Mokta. It takes just one infected person to start a cluster. The lives, especially of our elderly, are at stake. And they can be right in the homes of these HPB operations. The circuit breaker would need to be extended if community transmissions remain high. So we are not backpedaling. We are just making a decision because the situation has improved. Hence, as we make difficult decision to restrict the operations of CBBs, I hope everyone understands why. National carrier Singapore Airlines is reportedly evaluating aircraft deferrals and examining its option to sell and lease back some aircraft. This in view of the prevailing market conditions due to the pandemic. When approached by CNA to verify the reports in American business magazine Forbes and world's largest aviation news site Simple Flying, SIA says it has explored other traditional funding channels such as secured financing and sale and leaseback transactions, although opportunities remain limited in current market conditions. In March, SIA slashed 96% of its scheduled capacity and salaries of senior employees as the pandemic battered the industry. It extended its flight cancellations to end June amid global travel restrictions. In his Labor Day message, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said the government is determined to see SIA and the aviation sector through the current crisis. And coming up next on News 5, a surge in scams for the first quarter this year. Plus, massive queues outside liquor stores as India eases restrictions. Weather Report brought to you by Mitsubishi Electric. The resilience and solidarity budgets will help businesses stay afloat in these difficult times. $21.7 billion will flow to businesses as a wage support this year. In April and May, the wage subsidy for all local workers will be increased from 25% to 75% and will remain at 25% from June till end 2020. Sectors badly affected by the COVID-19 outbreak will get more help. The government will co-fund up to 75% of wages in the aviation, tourism and F&B sectors until end 2020. Taxi and private car drivers will receive $300 a month. The arts and culture sector will get help to save jobs, upskill and digitalize. Tax payments for companies and self-employed persons will be deferred for three months. Tenants at government-managed properties will receive up to three months of rental waivers. More companies will receive property tax rebates. Those most affected by COVID-19 will have the tax waived. The government will ensure that property owners pass on the property tax rebate in full to tenants. The foreign worker levy due in April and May will be waived. Employers will also receive a $1,500 levy rebate for each eligible worker. Companies will have access to credit through enhanced financing schemes. $20 billion loan capital will be set aside to support companies with strong capabilities and catalyze private sector loan capital. 
Let us unite, demonstrate our resilience, stay united, and press on in solidarity. Together, we will emerge stronger from this. Fish and chips are my favourite. No dear, it should be fish and chips is my favourite. Why not R? There are two things. Should be is. Fish and chips is one dish. I'm certain it's R. Let's connect. Let's speak good English. Welcome back to News 5. More than $41 million have been lost to scams in the first three months of this year. That's almost 30% more than the same period last year. And e-commerce was the top scam. People were cheated of at least $1.3 million through the sale of items like face masks and electronic products. Nearly 1,200 such scams were reported, more than twice the number of cases in the same period last year. Social media impersonation scams was next on the list. The number of cases increased more than tenfold, with at least $1 million lost. Loan scams rounded off the top three. They increased by nearly 50%, with at least $1.6 million cheated. Police said there has been a continuing trend of fake loan messages sent to bank customers. It added that banks and licensed moneylenders are not allowed to send out such advertisements. Well, meantime, about 40 rumours, scams or falsehoods relating to COVID-19 have been debunked since late January. Communications and Information Minister S.S. Warren says authorities have spared no effort to swiftly put out the facts and dispel false claims. Action has been taken against both Singaporeans and foreign parties for spreading falsehoods. Purveyors of falsehoods must be held accountable. accountable. But we all have a role to play in stemming the spread of false information, especially as some may have carelessly shared misinformation. It is of utmost importance, especially at a time of crisis like this, that each and every one of us does the right thing by checking that the messages we receive come from reliable sources and make the effort to verify a claim or piece of information before sharing it. Elsewhere, heavy traffic has returned to the streets of the Malaysian capital as most businesses reopened for the first time in six weeks. Thousands joined the morning rush hour in Kuala Lumpur with many heading to banks, shops and restaurants. Most have been closed since 18th of March, when the partial lockdown was first imposed to contain the spread of the virus. But not everybody is keen about the relaxation of measures. Nearly half a million people have signed an online petition urging the government to reinstate tough measures. They are worried about a new wave of infections. Some businesses have chosen to remain shut. Malaysia has more than 6,350 infections and 105 deaths. It's a mass opening. I'm not agree. La. I think it can do by faces. Every two weeks, um, different sectors book up. So, actually, I'm not happy. La. If you can see now, even the traffic is bad. Everyone's, literally, everyone's going out. Using the same excuses, pergi kerja. But nine of Malaysia's 13 states have decided to delay or ramp up measures. Selangor, which has the country's highest number of cases, says dine-in services will not be allowed and exercise will be only permitted in parts. The government says states will not be forced to adopt the new measures and can make adjustments to suit their needs. Well, migrant workers in Malaysia will have to undergo compulsory testing for COVID-19 and employers will have to bear the cost. Now, the Malaysian government says it's now incumbent upon employers to send their migrant workers for coronavirus testing. Now, this comes after the government's crackdown at the weekend on undocumented migrant workers and their efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19. Now, those without proper documents were arrested and reportedly taken to a depot where they will face action under the immigration laws. 
keputusan untuk menjaga kepentingan negara kita adalah hak kita dan kita laksanakan ini berdasarkan undang-undang yang ada cuba bayangkan kita boleh benarkan mereka bebas bergerak walaupun tidak ada dokumen perjalanan sekalipun kita dah kata kita akan memperketatkan kawalan sempadan untuk tidak membenarkan warga asing masuk ke negara kita termasuk lorong-lorong tikus pun kita akan sekat Human rights groups have criticized the government for failing to protect vulnerable groups amid the COVID-19 pandemic. They said the authorities had reneged on its earlier promise that migrants and refugees would not be arrested when they come forth for testing. And you can be sure that this puts fear in not just the undocumented migrants, but the entire migrants and refugees community. So if you're talking about ending the pandemic effectively, I don't see how this is going to contribute to that process. Because now you have section of the society who are afraid to come forward to get tested for COVID-19. And if they are positive, to get the right treatment. Because if they do, they may very likely be arrested. It started in the areas around Masjid India in downtown Kuala Lumpur. Thousands of migrant workers were cramped inside flat like these. Now more than 170 were tested positive at this Langor mansion, which has been under lockdown for weeks now. Employers say they will do their best to send their workers for tests, despite the financial constraints. Now among them is Victor Lo, whose restaurant was shut for more than six weeks after the partial lockdown. Most important for me is to protect my staff because they are concerned. They, to me, they are the fine liners. Have them on a schedule so they won't go loitering to protect themselves. As well. People tend to be more receptive now. There's no us and them anymore. We're all in it together. Now, Malaysia is home to about 2 million migrant workers, but the undocumented ones can be twice as many, making the authorities' task to test, track and treat them all the more difficult. Melissa Go, CNA, Kuala Lumpur. Japan has extended a COVID-19 state of emergency until the end of the month. Restrictions have been due to end on Wednesday, but Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says it's too soon to do so. He says there will be a review in two weeks, and if new infections have slowed enough, measures could be lifted early. Indian police had to use batons to beat back crowds queuing to buy alcohol for the first time in over a month. Hundreds queued at liquor shops across the country as the government eased some restrictions and allowed more businesses and certain shops to reopen. Some stores had to be closed soon after they opened, with people ignoring social distancing measures to queue. Millions of Europeans have emerged from coronavirus lockdowns. The hardest hit country, Italy, is leading the way after two months of confinement. But governments are now faced with a delicate balancing act. They must revive their economies without sparking a second wave of infections. Breathing a sigh of relief. For the first time in more than two months, Italians are free to go out and visit relatives again. Four and a half million people are back to work at construction sites and factories across the country. But it's not a complete return to normal. Restaurants and bars will only be able to handle takeaways and everyone must wear a mask in indoor public spaces. Though the use of public transport is discouraged, this train station in Milan has put in place safe distancing protocols so that those who do need to use trains and buses are kept safe. With almost 29,000 deaths from COVID-19, Italy has the world's second highest toll after the US. And it's taking care to ensure it doesn't reopen too quickly. Schools, cinemas and shops like hairdressers will remain shut. Across Europe, restrictions are being eased, with countries confident the worst of the outbreak is over. In Spain, small businesses like hardware stores and hairdressers are reopening again, though they won't be allowed to serve walk-in customers. Pues ahora es lo mismo, que es que estamos todos, eh, estamos intentando arrancar poco a poco, porque claro, llevamos sin facturar prácticamente, hemos facturado el 10%, 
y, y a ver cómo, cómo arrancamos, claro. En España, as well as neighboring Portugal, face masks will be compulsory for those in public transport. And still ahead on News 5, about 4,000 students return to school grounds during the second breakup period. Hello,我今天要送香品一个礼物。它的color,它的这一个沐浴露,有一个日本首创的吸附保湿科技,透过了这个绵密的泡泡,把一个吸附保湿的薄膜停留在我们的皮肤上面。冲洗后呢,肌
Um, and the impact of manufacturing sector will likewise be quite severe because biomedical has been known to be very volatile. It has been ramping up in terms of productions for the past few months already. So I expect within the next one to two months, you will see a sharp drop. Although Singapore's PMI results were in the negative territory, they were better than some regional PMIs. One economist thinks the support from the budget packages have buffered the sector from a worse economic fallout. Going forward, the economist suggests that while the manufacturing cycle could reach its bottom in the third quarter, PMI will continue to be in negative territory throughout 2020. In the second half of 2021, when uh, confidence returns uh, and hopefully when a vaccine is found for the virus, um, I, I would think that businesses will gain more confidence, uh, consumers will gain more confidence after that. Uh, so we will probably see a very slow recovery, uh, perhaps starting in the middle of next year. The Speaker of Parliament has reminded MPs to continue to lead the way in the fight against the COVID-19. And because it's not business as usual, Tan Chuan Jin added that there must be different ways to carry out roles and responsibilities. Now, his comments came at the start of today's sitting, where a bill is set to be introduced to allow for Parliament to sit at multiple locations. It is imperative that we prepare for exigencies such as the scenario where it is impossible, it's unsafe or inexpedient for all members to meet at one place for parliamentary proceedings. So we must be primed and ready to swiftly respond should such exigencies happen. About 4,000 primary and secondary school students return to campus daily during the full home-based learning period. They generally fall under three categories. Those whose parents are in essential services and don't have alternative caregiving arrangements. Those who face challenges learning at home, as well as students without sufficient digital devices or internet access at home. Requests from parents for the children to return to school were met as long as there were genuine needs. The challenge has in fact been the opposite, where schools invite the student to come back to school, but the parents were reluctant over various reasons. But schools will continue to try. To support students without sufficient digital devices or internet access at home, Ms Indrani said schools have loaned out more than 20,000 computing devices and 1,600 internet enabling devices to date. She added the number of students going back to schools for this purpose has dropped significantly. Nearly 300 people have sought shelter and assistance from the Social and Family Development Ministry during this circuit breaker period. Last July, less than half of the 65 people engaged were willing to accept help when a partners engaging in empowering rough sleepers or peers network was formed. Minister for Social and Family Development provided this update in response to queries about support given to the homeless community during this period. We are deeply grateful to our community partners and social service agencies in the peers network who have continued their efforts amid the COVID-19 outbreak by reaching out to homeless people and providing social intervention. We have also distributed care packs with hygiene kits and surgical masks to temporary shelter residents, as well as homeless persons in the streets, alongside encouraging them to accept shelter and help. 27 additional organizations have stepped up to offer temporary shelters, bringing the total number of organizations to 35. These places can accommodate about 700 people and about 400 spaces are currently available. Mr. Lee added that efforts have also been undertaken to ensure that this group of people receive the monetary benefits handed out by the government. Now, with regard to food delivery during the circuit breaker period, one MP asked if legislation will be considered to enable restaurants to pay lower commissions to third-party food delivery companies. Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Chi Hong Tat, says this needs to be carefully considered and that the commission rates are in line with those charged before the start of the pandemic. One important factor is that there are alternative options available to food services, businesses and consumers if they do not wish to go through the food delivery companies. They have explained what cost component goes to who, how much of it goes to the riders, how much of it goes to support the insurance, how much of it goes to supporting the IT systems and maintaining the customer databases. Parliament will debate two bills involving the import as well as usage of PMDs, bicycles and e-bikes in the next sitting.
Senior Minister of State for Transport Lam Pin Min posted on Facebook today, the government will introduce the Small Motorized Vehicles Bill as well as amend the Active Mobility Act to include path-connected open spaces. The bills will address some of the issues involving PMDs. Despite the significant decline of related accidents, a PMD caught fire as recent as March. Well, some riders have also restarted the use of non-compliant PMDs during the circuit breaker period. The two bills will also look to improve safety and enhance active mobility connectivity. Three other bills were also introduced in Parliament today. The first one will allow civil and Muslim marriages to be solemnized remotely. A proposed change to the constitution was also introduced to allow Parliament to sit at more than one location, which means that it could be conducted virtually. The last bill will look to incentivize environmental protection. And just before we go, here is a reminder that you can start your weekdays with a CNA 938 World Report every morning at 6. It's a complete wrap of news and business from around the globe. Plus, there's of course all your Singapore news and traffic. All of it on our news talk radio show, CNA 938. And uh, that's it from all of us here at News 5. Join us again tomorrow. Good night. This program is available on demand for free on MeWatch. Tonight on 5. Parental guidance is advised for the following program.